Our speaker, Beth David Howe, was born near the Florida Everglades, where growing up she gained a love of nature that has guided her choices ever since. Beth has a bachelor's degree in natural sciences from Auburn University and a master's degree in museum science and vertebrate paleontology from Texas Tech University. Her broad curiosity, interests, and skill have led her to an astonishing list of life experiences, from dinosaur digs and museum collections to jobs as a naturalist guide in some of our most significant national parks. As we shall see, her love of geology, biology, and photography have led her to explore the world from pole to pole on land and under the seas. A diver since 1998, Beth and her partner, cinematographer Tom Campbell, have traveled extensively to dive and film using their skills to bring us not only beauty, but a larger understanding of our natural world. Beth has been awarded the Educator of the Year by Conservation Science International. Please help me welcome Beth David Adams. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, thank you, everyone. I appreciate your having me here at the Audubon Society tonight. Um, I don't know if you can see, but I'm wearing the National Audubon Society pin because my family's been associated with the organization ever since I was a little kid. That's a long time. If you give me just a moment, I'm going to get set up here. Yeah, just go. been working with Russ for a few days getting all this coordinated, some interesting new technical stuff for me. I started photography long before digital came out, so pretty much everything I'll be showing tonight are original slides that were digitized for this presentation. So let's see if we have it. Can you hear me okay in the back? Yes. Okay, is it too loud? No. Okay, great. Thank you. So as Rebecca kindly introduced me, I am a photographer, although now I'm a cinematographer. I do motion film. I've been in Prescott, Arizona for about five years, moved here from Santa Barbara with Tom, and we also live part-time in Cable Bay in the far north of New Zealand. So tonight I'd like to share with you some of my adventures that I've had as a naturalist, a wildlife photographer, and a cinematographer on my peripatetic peregrinations from pole to pole. I just like saying that. So I operate a little company, just myself, called World Wild Productions, and since 2005 I've been with Tom in Tom Campbell Productions. For 20 years, I was a professional still photographer above the water, but since 05, Tom, who's a, a renowned underwater cinematographer, and I have traveled a lot filming underneath the seas. And being immersed in nature, whether above or below the ocean, really is my life. And I'm a naturalist because of these people. <laughs> yes, I blame them. Mom, Dad, my sister and brother, uh, fortunately, spent a lot of time outdoors. My parents, not only as Audubon members, but even before they were members of Audubon, were very keen to teach us about the natural world. And as children, we were constantly doing museum classes, whether it was summer breaks or holiday breaks, um, maybe learning about astronomy, learning about bugs, being at Biscayne Bay, which wasn't far, looking at seagrass communities. So all kinds of different things to feed our curiosity about the natural world, and I'm so grateful that my parents encouraged us. 
Growing up near the Everglades, I learned to love not only wild places, but all of the components that make up a healthy ecosystem. So while we did a lot of bird watching, I always wanted to know the why behind what I was seeing. And again, I was fortunate that my parents instilled this curiosity to learn more about the outdoors and also a desire to study the science about why I was seeing certain behaviors or what I was seeing in habitat. And very early on, we started to learn about conservation and why it was important to protect these things that we were seeing. And as I'm sure you know, the Everglades continues to be an area of critical concern. And my family still keeps um, pretty good tabs on that. My mom is very active with the Audubon Society in Miami as they try to protect the Everglades. So it's an ongoing interest for us. One of the things I really love, though, being out in the Everglades was the wide open, quiet space. Haven't any of you been down there? So you know what I'm talking about, right? Get away from the hustle and bustle of Miami and you're in that just quiet, peaceful, beautiful area, especially around the sawgrass prairies where all you hear is the wind through the sawgrass and bird song. And I've kind of come to call this need for quiet spaces where I can spend hours just sitting amongst plants and animals, birds, or bugs, my geography of being. And it defines who I am to my core. There's an American geographer, Yi Fu Tuan, who has a quote that I really like. He says, human beings set out from places where they feel a sense of attachment and journey into amorphous spaces characterized by a feeling of freedom or adventure and the unknown. I suffer from a condition known as eleutheromania. Some of you might have this too because it's contagious. <laughs> eleutheromania means that we love traveling to places where we can find freedom and adventure, as Yifu Wan said, and where the unknown can, through investigation, become known. And photography, and now cinematography, are my doors into that world where I can focus on the details of a larger picture and look at what makes up that picture. So in all the places between the Arctic and the Antarctic, from polar bears to penguins, I'm able to find my geography of being. Along the way, I became more passionate about understanding what I was seeing in order to better understand and know how to share what I was observing with others and to protect the habitats I was experiencing. I feel it's very important to be able to share these stories, to share what I've learned, and to take that knowledge and try to create an awareness where we can become better stewards of a certain part of our planet. So after undergraduate university at Auburn, where I studied, as Rebecca said, geography, biology, and geology, I moved to Texas Tech, and there I interned doing research in vertebrate paleontology at Petrified Forest National Park. I see a Petrified Forest hat here. <laughs> and I had a great time there. It was my first time being involved in any kind of public speaking where I was doing some little dinosaur, uh, we were washing out sediments, getting the little fossils from the Triassic period. So if you've not been to that park, I recommend it. And I was studying to be a vertebrate paleontologist. I wanted to explore the world and do dinosaur digs. But I initially had come to Texas Tech, and I chose that university for one reason. I found out that the paleontologist at Tech was working in Antarctica. And I always wanted to go there. I don't know why it always drew me to that southern continent. 
So I was initially hoping to study dinosaurs in Antarctica, but unfortunately, right after I got to TAC, my professor lost his National Science Foundation funding, and so I never got to go. It's quite disappointing, but as you know, life has a tendency to take different routes, and mine did the same. I ended up three summers at Petrified Forest, doing not only paleontology, but also becoming a National Park Service Ranger. I was in the interpretation division, so I led hikes, I gave programs, did a lot of presentations on site. And that's where I really learned to love sharing and communicating science with people from around the world. Yet something still kept pulling me to those higher latitudes, pulling me north, pulling me south, and I continued to migrate towards those areas of the globe. From Petrified, I headed north after I finished my master's. I was getting more into photography by this time, spending most of my free time when I summered as a ranger at Glacier National Park in Montana, for example, with a big lens like that attached to me. So a lot of the pictures that you'll see in this slideshow I guess it's not really a slideshow anymore. Uh, we're taken with that lens, which is a 500 millimeter lens on a Nikon camera body. Now, I brought my current camera system up here to show you, and once we turn the lights on, you're more than welcome to come look at it. It's a very, very different animal than this one in the picture. But I love being in those mountains, leading hikes sharing different things with visitors, and I fell in love with those high altitude habitats. And on weekends or days off, I'd go climb a mountain, go sit in a meadow, hang out with the mountain goats, spend hours alone just looking, observing the different rocks and imagining the various geologic um, habitats that had been there ages and ages ago, or sitting watching pika scurry around the rocks and build their nests or learning about the different flowers that colored the alpine meadows. My seasonal migrations then took me to Denali Park. Anybody been there? Oh, maybe you were on my tour bus. <laughs> you might have been if you were going, don't go off the cliff. Or my favorite was, can you see the petals? <laughs> I spent about six summers there, and I absolutely fell in love with, like the Everglades, the wide open spaces. So my geography of being felt absolutely at home there. Uh, the immense solitude of the huge spaces in Alaska are, are very soothing to me. But as a ranger, which is how I started my career at Denali, I got stuck in the visitor center. And there's nothing worse than being at a spectacular national park like that and working eight to five in a building, handing out tickets for the shuttle bus so everybody else can go and join the park, and then hearing the stories when they came back. Oh my gosh, we saw a pack of wolves running down Savage River, and then there was a grizzly right there, and the herd of caribou went over the hill, and I'm going, that's nice. That's <laughs> a good trip. So the only way I could get into the park and still share with people was to become a bus driver. <laughs> so I was still migrating back and forth between Lubbock, Texas at this point, and I went back home and got a job as a school bus driver. And I did that happily for a year to get my commercial license, and when I went back to Denali, I spent the next five summers driving the tour bus. And I loved it. I loved it. Every day, out in this spectacular landscape, seeing animals, talking about the geology, creating a narrative to share with everybody about this incredible place that is one of the crown jewels in our national park system. And I had a chance to do photography while I was there, uh, which was nice. So for five summers, I started to build up my photography and writing business. And I did that for 20 years. I saw some fabulous landscapes and animals there. 
And the populations, due to climate change, hunting pressure outside the park, and other factors are now affecting the wildlife up there, and the climate's changed considerably. So my friends who still drive up there, um, and with whom I stay in touch, tell me that it's quite a different landscape from what I observed and photographed back then. But it's still a magical place where you can see a bear peering out from the brush right at you. Or maybe a wolf trotting alongside the road. I had the opportunity one evening, I was standing on the park road with the wolf biologist, and we were watching a pack of wolves right across from us, the adult and the puppies of the year. And then a couple of the other wolves, the adults, crossed the road and went up the road behind us up into the hill. And the pack started to howl. And we were there that beautiful evening with the pack just round robin and howling all around us. And it's one of my favorite memories of being at Denali. And many times I had the opportunity to see the last light turn the mountains rose with their alpine glow. So boy, my geography of being was really happy right up here. And the high latitudes continue to be my lodestone, that calling. One day I was standing in the post office at Denali, waiting in line to collect my mail, and I happened to see in the trash can a brochure. And it was a brochure for a company that ran trips to Antarctica. Wow. <laughs> I'm thinking this might have been around 1998 or 99, somewhere in there, I can't even remember. So I called the company. Back then, you didn't email. Uh, we had fax machines. But I called, left messages repeatedly, never heard back. But eventually, about five months later, I got a call out of the blue. I was at home visiting family, and the person on the other end, when I answered, didn't introduce themselves. They just said, you still want to go to Antarctica? <laughs> Who is this? Yeah. Oh, well, if you can be the ornithologist, we have a job for you, but you have to be ready next week. <laughs> never having been to Antarctica, never having seen a penguin, much less a blue petrel or any of the albatross, I had to now become the expert on an expedition cruise ship. <laughs> Thankfully, the one thing you do learn at grad school is how to do research. So I put that into high gear. I did a lot of research. I called up friends who were penguin researchers on um, in the uh, islands down there, and I was able to put together half a dozen lectures, and even on the ship, trip down on the ship, I was still being crying in blue petrol, which is the right wing pattern, but it went good. So I finally made it, and I've now done 14 trips. I know at least one person in the audience who's been there. Anybody else have had the opportunity? Yay. Excellent. I highly recommend it fabulous place. It's like nothing you've ever experienced. The polar latitudes really feel as though they're a million miles away from this real world. And the one thing that impressed me most, I think, down there, it feels like you're back in a glacial epoch and you feel the weight of the immensity of the ice on the land. It's, it's really quite profound. Within, I'd say, two days of being down there, you can hear people talking about how they've completely run out of superlatives. No adjectives work. And now, of course, awesome is anything. So awesome down there is like, oh yeah, awesome. But it truly is. <clears throat> I think this little guy was on one of his first forays off the ice. It's a young and daily penguin. He was cute. He was I'm hesitant, waiting to make the jump. Can I do it? Can I do it? <laughs> Finally did. Uh, so it was fascinating for me to learn about the different inhabitants of this polar region, their special adaptations, the different ecosystem requirements that they have. Uh, it's an absolutely fascinating area. And one of my favorite places 
that I've managed to get to a few times en route to or from Antarctica is South Georgia. If you have a chance to go there, it absolutely is mind-boggling. When you step ashore and you've got hundreds of thousands of king penguins on a given beach, giant elephant seals lying on the beach to greet you, it's, it just overwhelms the senses. Sometimes the trips stop on the Falkland Islands, and after stopping there on one or two of these expedition cruises, I went back to stay for three weeks at different locations in the islands. Again, if you like birds and other wildlife, I cannot recommend this place high enough. Unbelievable diversity of bird life, wildlife. Uh, it's just overwhelming what you see. You could have, you might be sitting in a colony of black browed albatross one side, there's a Gen 2 colony right below you, penguins going in and out of the ocean, rock hoppers going up and down the cliffs on a, right around the corner, elephant seals and seals and little uh, wrens running around on the beach. You, you can't take it all in. <laughs> so just sitting on a cliff and watching the constant comings and goings and comings and goings of penguins can keep you busy all day long there. So this is definitely a place I, I want to return to one day. These are a couple black-browed albatross pair bonding. And they let you sit right amongst the colony. I mean, I was closer to them than I am to the front row here, and with their chicks in the nest and them flying all around, and just the sounds and ah, magic. In 1996, I moved from Alaska, a move I still kind of regret, but I went to Bozeman, Montana, so that wasn't too bad. <laughs> and in Bozeman, you're really close to Yellowstone Park, and I bet more hands would go up if I asked who's been to Yellowstone. Yeah, yeah, talking about one of our crown jewel parks. I still continue to do Antarctic trips from Bozeman. I also was working for a couple expedition companies, so I spent a lot of time in the Sea of Cortez. I've done the Caribbean, the Amazon. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time in Alaska's Inside Passage, working on ships that carried about 120 maximum passengers. And after that, I started to work as the naturalist and first mate on custom charters that only took maybe 10 people. And that's very special to be on either a tiny ship or with a small group where you get so close to the wildlife and spend a lot of quality time with them. So the nice thing about being in Bozeman was that it's a good location from which to travel into western areas that have a lot of wildlife. One thing I don't have up here are photographs of grouse, which are one of my favorite birds. I've been fortunate to spend time on the lex with the um, sage grouse and the, um, the, the prairie chickens. Uh, that's something I'd like to do again. My favorite are prairie dogs. Um, I know not, too, not a lot of people share that love. I happen to be really fond of rodents and squirrels and things like that. But I spent eight hours at this little colony, and this group of youngsters was frightened into their burrow when a large raptor went over. And after one of the adults gave the all clear signal, the little ones came back up, and they were reassuring each other with little kisses like this. So the one thing for me about photography is that sometimes to get the shot, you have to sit for a long, long time. But for the eight or nine hours that I was there, I was happy. I was watching the animals. I was enjoying the weather, looking at the flowers. It's all part of the lovely day spending in the outdoors. And they're just so cute. They need kissing. 
spent a lot of time in Yellowstone, where they're sitting on a hill with bighorn sheep and watching them. And the thing with photography is it's really easy to just to click, 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 or back then, and fire the trigger. But waiting for all the elements to come together to get that magic shot is part of the patience. You want to look at the composition. What does the background look like, which is as important, I think, as your subject? Waiting for the right behavior, waiting for the light. It all comes together in that magic moment and makes all that waiting worthwhile. Not that just sitting there enjoying it wasn't worthwhile <laughs> in and of itself. I enjoyed many hours wandering through the forest of Yellowstone. I've had the opportunity on separate trips to take my parents through the same forest where I photographed the great gray owl. My brothers come on trips with me there. Um, just people I've met while walking around the park. Hey, come on, I'll show you a great gray owl. Uh, they hunt in forests not far from the Yellowstone Falls area. And sometimes you'll find an owl, and owls generally are very cool with having you around them. Who doesn't care if you spend all day as it hunts through the meadows? Sandhill cranes nested by rivers right outside the park, and they were a lot of fun to watch. And I continued to make forays elsewhere, especially to those high latitudes. Had a fabulous time one year. Took three weeks during the summer to go up to Greenland. This was before Greenland was on a lot of radars. In fact, um, my photographic partner and I were the first to take a direct flight. I forget what airline it was now, maybe Air Canada from the United States over without having to transit through Iceland first. Now, a lot of companies are offering tours and trips and stays in Greenland. But it was really neat to be some of the first people there. And we camped in a little tent out on the tundra and would often wait to caribou walking through. And mainly we were there to fill muskox. And we got very lucky with them. Uh, talk about a lot of patience to move around these huge animals, but boy, do you feel like you're back in the place to see yourself there around these amazing creatures. So kind of an odd combination of a, I think a sheep and a, a cow. It's a, a strange creature. But in Greenland, we met some scientists who took us up to the Peregrine Falcon Cliffs. That was really interesting. I hadn't expected that. I knew the peregrines nested there, but to be able to not only be shown the nest by the scientists, these birds are, are banded, you can't see it in the shot here, but the, um, the ledge where we had to climb was quite difficult to access, but we were able to do so as he put the rings on the um, legs of the little puffy chicks. <laughs> and then in 98, again, like in Antarctica, you get a phone call. You want to be a guide in Manitoba? What do you know about polar bears? No problem. I got it down. So within a you know, few weeks, you get out all your research, you talk to the experts, and you become an expert yourself, so you can talk to people from around the world about polar bears. So I love that. I love having to learn about these things. I love having to learn their physiology, their habitat requirements. Everything about them is so interesting to me. And I spent five weeks in Churchill, polar bear capital of the world, it's called. The year I was there, it was so hot. There was no snow, no ice. There were a few bears, most of them like this. Just, oh, I can't bear this. We saw, I want to say maybe three bears, and let me tell you, after five weeks, your visitors are getting a little antsy. We'd see one bear maybe walking along the tundra without snow, without ice. And when you're a photographer and you've come so far to get that classic picture of the bear on the ice, two bears sparring, which I think You've probably all seen those photographs. It can be pretty disappointing. Because one thing you learn 
is that nature works on her own terms. As much as we want that shot, if the climate isn't happening, if the animals aren't there, it is what it is, and I've learned to enjoy whatever else is happening and not get so focused on getting the shot that my whole trip is going to get ruined. So one of the things that we were fortunate to do was observe Arctic fox. This little guy was running around the camp one day, and uh, they're quite curious, very friendly little creatures, it seems, so we got the nice opportunity to photograph him. And finally, I want to say it was on Halloween, it was that late in the year, we got a little bit of ice, and the bears finally moved in. These two bears were sparring out on the ice, uh, really enjoying the cold that finally showed up. So I see climate change um, happening in places I go to. I've seen it especially in southeast Alaska where year after year after year I've gone to a certain glacier on a cruise ship and then maybe I'll miss three or four years and when I go back the glacier is so far back it's shocking. And then when I turned 40, uh, my story took a little bit of a different turn. I was diagnosed with and did treatment for breast cancer. Uh, thankfully, it was just a bump in the road for me. But while I was undergoing treatment, and I did so while I was at my parents' house in Miami, I started to raise monarch butterflies. And I, it was the first time I had a film camera, motion camera. And I filmed the butterflies as I was going through treatment, kind of on a parallel, as a transform, transform, transformation. It was a transformative experience for me and to watch the butterflies. And I drew parallels between the two. I got my mom involved as a director and cameraman, and frequently, if I was having a chemo treatment, I'd hand her the camera and say, okay, now make sure you go from the IV drip here, pan down here, make sure you get the drug going in here. So I ended up putting a little film together about that. And I was more enthralled with the editing and storytelling process than I was with anything. I thought, wow, this is even better than writing magazine articles. I have to be a filmmaker. I have to tell stories. And so that was the turning point. I now only have a still camera in my phone, and I shoot with this big monster over here. But right after I went through chemo and was back on my feet, I went to a film festival in Montana. If any of you have been with National Audubon for a long time, you might remember a fellow by the name of Chris Palmer in the late 70s who was one of the presidents or something of the organization. And he was friends with my mom and dad way back when. Curiously, I had got to know him through connections, through photography at National Wildlife Federation, and as all these little rivers tend to flow and wind together, Chris said, if you want to be a cinematographer, why don't you come out to Montana to the International Wildlife Film Festival? We'll just introduce you around to everybody. We'll give you a little start here. Wouldn't you know, the first person he introduced me to was Tom. That was how that story started, and we've been together since. I moved to Santa Barbara with Tom in 2005 and worked in his office for quite a while. You know, now we are, we're partners for, in everything. And uh, in 2011, we moved here to Prescott. So we work underwater. This is the two of us in the Channel Islands, and that large piece of machinery Tom is holding this is a high-definition camera. Tom was one of the first to pioneer high-definition when National Geographic, BBC, Discovery, all those big networks said, high-definition is a fad. It is never going to happen. You are wasting your time with this expensive equipment that you've just bought. But Tom believed in it, and he filmed in it. And a few years later, Nat Geo said, hmm, you know what? We kind of like high-def. We're going we're gonna to start doing shows in it. Maybe you can give us a really good rate on footage. <laughs> so he's a very smart businessman. Probably one of the first 
three maybe, I think he owned the first one or two housings that ever went underwater. We now live and work part-time in the far north of New Zealand. Uh, we're doing a lot of underwater shooting there, so we'll be going over in December through April where we have a boat and we're filming a little documentary about the bay that we live on. And we do that mainly for the local schools as an educational program. So we've dived and filmed in many locations. I drive them crazy on the boat because I'm always looking at birds when everybody else wants to do something else. But uh, we spend a lot of time underwater, whether it's Papua New Guinea or Palau, Komodo. Uh, we've been a lot in Mozambique where we shot a story for the BBC. Done a lot of diving in Mexico. I did not tell my mom I was going down to get underwater with crocodiles. Yeah. I waited till we got back okay from that one. But we go to a lot of far from flung places to do these documentaries, and it really revealed a lot of issues that you hear about in the news to our eyes. We see so many things happening in the ocean and the ecosystems in which these animals live. And probably the worst thing we see is the amount of plastic. Plastic everywhere. We made a really foolish mistake recently. We were in Komodo, spectacular location, stunning scenery, phenomenal reef life, absolutely gorgeous. Even 30 feet down, plastic bags wafting in the current on a reef. Um, we've come up from a dive as the current was changing, pushing aside plastic. Just the ocean currents taking plastic from everywhere, moving it into beaches. Our mistake was, we tried to get really good footage of the Komodo dragons. Cool lizards. But there was so much plastic on the beach, we couldn't get a clean shot of the lizard. So we're like, oh my gosh. But wouldn't you know, about six months ago, we got a request from a production company. Do you have any pictures of dragons in the plastic? <laughs> sure, I took them with my phone. Literally a foot of plastic trash covering beaches on which the Komodo dragons were walking. Plastic is everywhere out there. I am so critical about carrying plastic bags. I don't touch them. Um, and we're very careful about using plastic. Now last year, I finally had the opportunity to return to my first love after about a decade of not being on ships, which is to work topside or above the water as a naturalist. I was hired as photographer in residence to be on a ship in Svalbard or Spitsbergen. And that was really exciting to spend five weeks aboard the MS Expedition traveling around and seeing all the wildlife in that high arctic realm, which finally took me into the true polar latitudes. The cruises I worked on were called Realm of the Polar Bear, and we were fortunate to see some bears. Can you see the one in this shot? It was far away. We saw a few bears up close, maybe feeding on carcasses or crossing rocks. Uh, other trips were fortunate to see bears right next to the ship crossing ice. So again, it's luck of the draw. Ship behind you might get a better view, you don't know. But it was unbelievably beautiful. We saw a variety of wildlife. The small caribou, our Perry's caribou, is a very tiny polar reindeer. Quite a few walrus. Uh, we saw them in the water as well as on haul-outs where we would stop to observe them for a couple hours. Cliffs like this one in the lower left, oh, it just went on and on, covered in nested mirrors. Beautiful, beautiful sight with them whirling all around. And the, the geese on some of the islands were nesting. But for me, I think it was the dramatic, spectacular scenery, just breathtaking, that impressed everybody the most with this profound beauty. Uh, it felt good to be back up in the north. This picture in the lower left is at about 1 o'clock in the morning. So we had true polar night. It never got dark up there. Um, and we saw a lot of these same conservation issues 
that are threatening the whole global community. Quite a bit of plastic, much of which was washing in from currents coming from northern Russia down into the Svalbard region. Some of these little peri caribou, when they rub their antlers in plastic nets that were on shore, would get tangled and die. Um, it, it was quite shocking, actually, to see how much was there. It didn't detract at all from the beauty and spectacular uh, scenery that we observed, however. It was a real shock, though, to come back home to all the noise and chaos because the election cycle was starting and uh, all the noise and, and just all the stuff going on down here. I was like, send me back, please get me out of here. And uh, I got lucky because one of our stock agencies, and most of our footage goes to agents that market around the world to different production companies, sent me an email and said, do you by any chance have any muskox footage? Uh, no, but I know where to go get it. So poor Tom, off I went again, left him behind. And I went this time to the Canadian Arctic, north of Quebec, in uh, the Nunavik area, about two and a half hours north of Montreal. Good excuse to return to my beloved north in order to get muskox footage. We camped out on the tundra by a short lake shore and hiked out every day and spent hours sitting with muskox, observing and filming them in the wild. I can you see them in this picture? Can you see the lake shore? The little dots there. So you're very, very careful moving in slowly, 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 always watching your behavior and only moving closer when they're calm and they're, they're not threatened. So one of the things we really try and do as wildlife photographers or cinematographers is not affect the behavior of the animals that we're photographing or filming. Yeah, we, the last day we were there, we got really lucky with this group. Uh, we spent the whole time with a group of about 23, and I don't know if they were just used to us or what, but we, we were able to get fairly close. And sitting there, watching them go about their natural lives, completely unconcerned with our presence, and just kind of being away from the chaos gets you connected back to the natural world. I highly recommend spending time with muskox if you have the opportunity. <laughs> and at night, oh, the skies lit up with the aurora. That was right from our camp. There's a lot, lot up there to see and observe. And this year I returned, that's me schlepping the big huge pack and tripod, um, for the caribou migration. It's the last largest caribou herd on the continent. It's called the Leaf River Caribou Herd. There's about 330,000 animals up there. And it was interesting. I had people join me from Europe and uh, a couple other locations. We traveled from Montreal by commercial plane to a town called uh, Kujuak, two and a half hours north, then a smaller plane into Kabersuk, a community of about 600 Inuit, and from there by Inuit canoe, two and a half hours upriver. And we stayed at this little camp, you can see there on the left, is an Inuit hunting and fishing camp, and we have a little cluster of tents down there. I carry a drone with me now so I can do aerial filming and photography. But it's interesting learning from Inuit elders, especially how climate change is dramatically affecting the plant and animal life of this region. They're seeing some major differences up there. We spend quite a bit of time hiking into the high country. The caribou come across these hills and down across the river. It was so hot this summer, so hot, the caribou stayed way up north on the shores of Ungaba Bay. It was hot, it was buggy, but after eight days out of a 10-day trip, the weather changed, it got cool, the bugs blew away, and the caribou came on the move, and boy, was it exciting to see them top that rise where just the previous day we'd been sitting, have them come down the hill, step across, and swim across the river towards us. We were just sitting in the brush, waiting, kind of hidden, 
and they came right by us. Another trip I highly recommend. <laughs> so for me, being in the wide, open, quiet spaces where my geography of being is at home is important and it grounds me. And sharing these experiences with others is my true passion. It really makes everything that I've done all the more special. And it helps me not only connect my spirit to the natural world, but in a way, I think, to help other people connect their spirits too. And one of the things I'm trying to do now is help people find ways to reconnect the human spirit to our natural world. Because I think in all this chaos that we're bombarded with, whether it's about all the disasters hitting our planet, um, I think we lose sight of the magic and mystery that's out there. And it's hard sometimes to find that grounding in all that chaos. And sometimes just going out in the garden and watching the birds is all it takes. Now, before you guys fall asleep, um, I know we're getting close to, to the end here. I'd like to share a short video with you. I'm going to take you underwater here and share with you some of the footage that Tom and I filmed when we were in Komodo, Indonesia.
Well, thank you for sharing this evening with me and allowing me to share it with you. This has been great. Thank you so much. If anybody has any questions, uh, do I have time for a few? Okay. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. What are my plans for the future? Our, our closest plans, we're off to dive the California Channel Islands in about a week and a half, and then in December we'll return to New Zealand till mid-April. I'm trying to organize some more trips back to the Canadian Arctic, whether it's for caribou or muskox in Aurora, I'm not sure. Uh, I also have a request from somebody to do an Alaska trip, so not quite sure yet, but definitely I've got to get back north. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll show you real quick. Um, the camera that we're most familiar with are these Nikon or Canon still cameras. And I think a lot of us have a SLR or now a DS, is it a single lens reflex, yeah, DSLR. Uh, the camera we shoot with now is called RED. That's the name of the company, it's Digital Cinema. The camera in my hand is the same one that James Cameron and Sir Peter Jackson and others use for filming movies. We can shoot IMAX film with this. We're no longer shooting high definition, we're now shooting 6,000 lines of resolution. So when I'm on these trips, like with the caribou and muskox, I carry this in my backpack. <laughs> I'm not sure what it weighs, but the worst part is I have to carry all the batteries with it. And that's the heavy part. It's basically a computer. You have to put a viewfinder on it to see through, a lens to, to film with, a battery. And this is the hard drive. We're all familiar with cameras and drives and stuff. This is 512 gigabytes. And so uh, it's quite an interesting system now. But it doesn't get much better than that, except now, of course, they've just announced the 8K, the resolution camera. We're not going there quite yet. All right, well, that's uh, the end of the questions. Thank you so much once again. It's been a real pleasure and an honor to be with you. And return to the next. Thank you so much.